So the Super 8 world, and, and forgive me if I'm reading some of this because, um, you know, to get my thoughts in order, it, uh, sometimes it's better to uh, do it on, uh, on text, including the questions I'm going to ask him. But the Super 8 world has a number of colourful characters these days, from wizards and alchemists, such as my previous guests, Adrian Cousins and uh, Daggy Brundert. And um, while we're making courtly metaphors, if I can be described as the court jester of Super 8, my guest this week is the king himself. However, as he's American, it's more accurate to describe him as the president, because he is indeed the president of Pro 8 Millimeter. Now, Pro 8 Millimeter started life in 1971 as Super 8 Sound, and since 1982 has been run, has been called Pro 8 and been run by my guest and his partner, steadily branching into every stage of the Super 8 supply chain, from cameras and film stock to processing, digitizing, and preserving film as a medium. They were the first to cut down no Kodak negative stock for Super 8. You heard it here first. They were the first ones to do it, not Kodak. They took Kodak 35 mil, cut it down for Super 8 and sold it in uh, before Kodak did it. And um, as the Super 8 industry underwent cataclysmic changes in the last 40 years, one name has been a constant reminder to industry and amateur filmmakers alike that the format was alive and kicking. Looking to the future, he has been at the forefront of training tomorrow's filmmakers and raising awareness of Super 8 and other small formats, as well as leading the field in research into new ways of using the format. He is the author of The Power of Super 8 Film and known throughout the industry as a fountain of knowledge that he is always willing to share with both expert and novice. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Phil Vigent. Phil. Hey, that's one hell of a good intro. <laughs> yeah, I like, I like to do a whole rundown of everyone I have on the show. It's, uh, how are you doing? How's, thing, how's things in uh, Los Angeles? Uh, like yourself, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a hermit too. So I, none of these problems have really affected me too much. You mm. know, I go into my cave and, and do my thing and then go home. So lockdown hasn't really bothered me as much as it has other people excellent yeah me too me too although i wish my cave had what's behind you there that's a very <laughs> impressive looking digitizing machine yeah it's nice to have a really nice 6.5k scanner in your uh, in your office oh you know, man it's handy you know when you're doing your work oh god it puts my little wolverine to shame anyway <laughs> so um I phil I, sorry i didn't hear you, you, you got to start somewhere. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know, I know, right. I know, I know. Eventually, I might move up to a, 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 a what's it called, a retro scan, and uh, you know, from there, I don't know. I'd have to talk my wife into agreeing to buy something more com it's complex pretty, than that. It's pretty much the way it works, you know. I, I think my first, I, I used to build telecines, you know, back in the must have been the early '80s. That was one of the first parts of this that we got involved with. You know, mm. that I, I, you know, did technically. Mm. And we were putting like five bladed shutter project, uh, uh, five bladed shutters in projectors so we could transfer it 24. And then we were varying the speed, you know, oh, to yeah. 20 frames per second so that we could transfer 18 and mm. you know, do all these things, you know, to make the whole process of film to uh, video kind of work mm. uh, for a personal kind of thing. So, mm. uh, well, you know, I know that world of starting out, you know, with the, with the least expensive way of doing it. Mm, mm. And over time, you know, you just keep sort of progressing. Mm. And, uh, you know, we went from that to, I think we used a Sony BM2100, which mm. had like a synchronizing capacity between the film and the video. So we could do very speeds and oh, wow. from that to ranks and then high speed ranks and yeah, I think my wife is about ready to throw me out when I bought the Millennium. You know, it's almost a million dollars, you know, on a, a piece of equipment to scan film. Whoa. <laughs> so, uh, well, yeah. actually, that, to that end, that's an interesting um, a point you make up. But is your end ambition to give your know, Super 8 cameras all the functionality of 16 mil and to make Super 8 look as absolute sharp and high res as possible? Uh, definitely as sharp and as high res as possible. I don't know about trying to imitate 16. I mean, I spent a lot of years trying to do that. I mean, that was, 
probably the goal for probably a decade of my life is just like, how can we make a cheaper version of 16? Mm. And at some point in the music video um, era, we started to realize that Super 8 had its own character, its own reason to be, and that it was much more important than just being a cheap knockoff of 16. Mm -hmm. And that you could do different things with it that you couldn't really do at 16. Ah, that, so, that brings me on to my, my next question, which is that what is it about small format film that makes it so special? Uh, there's some combination of the ease of use that, that it's accessible to everyone. So it doesn't take the knowledge base that larger film formats need. So you can take someone who's really not technically inclined and they can still use it. So it, it diversifies the medium amongst all kinds of people from young, very young people to, you know, like I say, people who don't really like technical, but still mm. have amazing aesthetic judgment. So mm. they can work with it because it's not that technical and still come up with unbelievably beautiful images because they understand, you know, the, the aesthetics of the image, not mm. the technical of running a camera. Well, so are we... Really are we seeing an in are we seeing an increase in the number of people using it super eight again for home movies and and special effects uh we're definitely seeing more people using super eight than ever mm -hmm. um they're probably using no more super eight than we have been using because they use less of it and they do mm -hmm. very creative things with very little amounts of film mm -hmm. so in the past you would have had you know, an average, let's say the wedding market, you'd, you'd have an average guy working on a wedding, shooting six to 10 rolls of film. Uh, and you had X number of those guys. And now you have 10 times that many people doing it, but they're all using one roll of film to do their wedding. Mm -hmm. So the, the numbers of people involved here have gone up exponentially, but right. they're, they've all discovered ways of using very small quantities of film for the economics to work. Yeah. Well, you're, you're in a unique position of, of, of catering to the domestic and the uh, professional, the industry as well. Um, yeah. So what part does Super 8 play in the, in the professional sphere these days? Um, so everything from, you know, we worked on like Star Wars a couple of years ago to, you know, so at, at that level, you know, Chris Nolan kind of stuff. Um, occasionally uses, you know, all kinds of media to, to do maybe just one shot, you know, in a movie. So wow. having that diversity here in Hollywood of all these medias uh, makes it so that, you know, we can participate in, in major motion pictures with uh, some shot or scene or opening title credit with like, uh, you know, a hundred million dollar film could have Super 8 in it. That's that's fascinating to me. How I I, have no, I had no idea that that I mean okay I know that the Super 8 look is is sought after by you know music videos and advertisements and stuff, but I had no idea other than you know the obvious Steven Spielberg Super 8 film. Um, yeah. I had no idea that that the productions like Star Wars and and directors like Chris Nolan were actually using Super 8. Yeah, you know, there's like like scene insert shots, you know, things that you just like a very small parts, but you know, when you're doing a major motion picture where one special effect shot might be a half a million dollars, uh, it's worth getting authentic if you want to have, um, let's say once upon a time in Hollywood, for example, there's a scene in there where, uh, they're in uh, the pool out back and, uh, there's some conversation about, you know, the, the past and, and a whole movie comes up, you know, mm -hmm. to, to support the, you know, the narrative that's going mm -hmm. on in that scene. Mm -hmm. well, you know, that's a, a Super 8 shot, you know, right. you know, it's got half a dozen shots of, you know, some family members that they produce to, to create that, you know, insert part of that movie. Mm -hmm. One one question's just come through on the chat asking if the hologram shots in Star Wars were, were Super 8. I don't think so. I, I, when I saw the movie, this was for the last, when I actually went to see the production that we worked on, I didn't see any footage in there that I could identify. Mm. So 
I don't always know in the production whether we got cut, you know, and, and it's on the mm. edi editing floor, so to speak, mm. or whether there was never a purpose for the movie itself, but it was a part of like the making of, um, you know, okay. you've got sub productions that come off of major productions. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, you're going to have a making of uh, documentary that's going to be two hours long about it. So they need a lot of footage. And sometimes mm. in the making of, it's kind of interesting to have these sort of segue shots. You know, you see the sprocket and then it's like, you, you know, you, you're talking about it from a, you know, from a documentary standpoint. Mm. And then you show the actual shot. So the, these make great lead ins and trail outs to stuff. Mm. So it could have just been part of that design or, you know, mm. maybe someone on set, you know, that someone wanted to give a camera to, uh, you know, <laughs> you never really know, right. you know, like where it's going to be. Right, right, right. Um, you, you have a very close relationship with Kodak. Um, and um, do you know, can you tell us anything about their future plans for the medium? Are they keeping in uh, keeping up to date with what, what, what people want and what they, what they need? Yeah, they keep, uh, you know, reinforcing to me that Super 8 sales are still growing. Uh, so in, uh, just from an economic standpoint, something that grows is worth, you know, continuing with. Hmm. Uh, I've always tried to present the fact that if you don't have 8, you probably won't in the future have 16 and 35 because you'll never have somebody starting out. So right. you know, you'll eventually wipe the whole thing out if you don't continue to promote something that sources new blood into the filmmaking process. Mm. And Super 8 is really that, that first stepping stone towards, you know, someone, you know, developing a career mm. in film or moving into 16 millimeter or, you know, yeah. so, you know, it's kind of critical mass to them. Right. Uh, and I think as a company, you know, not that I'm a, you know, a, in terms of corporate, you know, Wall Street stuff, but as a company, they they are a film company and, and they need to maintain that identity. And I don't think they can walk away from film for that reason alone, because it's who they were and it's who they are. And if they give that up, they kind of, from a brand standpoint, I think it would really be detrimental to them to walk away from film. Mm. Mm. You know, it really stands them out. Oh, you know, it's their heritage, mm, right? Absolutely. So, I think mean, they'll hold on to it even if it doesn't make money. You know, it'll, yeah. it'll still be there. Well, um, one other thing, I one thing I I want to draw attention to is the amazing work that Pro 8 Millimeter does in, in refitting and rebuilding, basically, uh, Super 8 cameras from the ground up. Because, of course, you know, as that Synchronex uh, camera shows, you know, the shooting on Super 8 is only as, only as good as the cameras that you're able to use. And so many of the old cameras are kind of, you know, nearing, or part, some parts of them are nearing the end of their useful lives. And, and, if, and eventually, all the original ones are just going to break down. I know some are longer lasting than others. But the fact yeah. of the matter is, is that Pro 8 have been taking film, uh, cameras like this one, the, uh, the Bolia for Professional, the 6, 608, is it 6008? Yeah. And, yeah. and rebuilding it as a Max 8, which, by the way, uh, I'm going to show in a minute, but that's, that's to maximize the, the frame to make it a 16 by 9 rather than 4.3. Um, you also do the rebuild, the, the, the classic Bolia 4008 ZM2, um, the Canon 814 Auto Zoom, which I'm pleased to say I have. And then, of course, the Ronda Cam, the Canon 310, which is uh, rebuilt as the Ronda Cam. Which is uh, which is a lovely little camera. I have one that doesn't work. Uh, you you can have it if you want. You can, if you want to build it, <laughs> I need the parts. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, I'll send it over. Um, All right. But I was um, going to say that's 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 for me. That's one of the most exciting things that Pro Eight does is is the actual rebuilding of cameras because you know these cameras that you work on are going to last a lot longer than the originals, and and therefore you know. Even even after you and I have gone, these cameras will probably uh, be the ones that you make will will probably be still working, and that's very exciting for the uh, for the, for the future of the medium. But I was yeah. that leads me on to that qu um, a question about the Kodak, the famous Kodak Super 8 camera. Do you have any information? Do you know what, when if that's ever going to come out? You know, about eighteen months ago, they went completely dark about 
any information about that to anybody. Right. So there's been absolutely nothing said about the production of the camera in a year and a half. Mm. But there has been some projects that have been done using the camera, and you'll see some stuff that, that's been out there in the world it's, that, that actually used the camera. It's, so, yeah. Very in, uh, enticing footage has come out. Look, making some of the results I've seen off of that, the, 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 the tests they've done. So it's, it's kind of a tease, you know. They, they, we see some footage from it, uh, mm. you know, in terms of the lab. We have here processing it and scanning it, and mm. projects that we know that are, but we have hear nothing about the camera <laughs> in mm. terms of, like, is it coming? When is it coming? How mm. much is it coming for? Like, nothing. That absolute uh, radio silence. Even with um, your contacts, you can't get a. Uh, with my contacts, it's uh, like, nope, <laughs> you won't take it. Uh, <laughs> um, be, you know, maybe that's a strategy of some sort. You know, they, they got all that publicity for it and then they didn't come out with it. So then it was a little embarrassing. So maybe right. you know, they don't want to say anything until they're ready to go or maybe they dropped the whole idea altogether. Mm. I really don't know. Um, what, what we decide to do is, you know, exactly like your experience, you can, you can do it one or two ways. You can either go on eBay, buy a cheap camera, hope that it works. Uh, you know, you have that experience. And if it fails, you get another one. And you know, it fails, you know, because there's a bunch of things inside these cameras that really need to kind of been gone over again. Mm -hmm. So instead of going through it that way, we buy the cameras off eBay. We strip them down. We rebuild them back the way they should be, mm. and the reliability then returns to the camera because now you've kind of addressed all the issues that they've accumulated over the last fifty years. Mm. That's so. You know, a, a four thousand eight, which that is, you know, now classic. Mm. You know, that went almost fifty years. So Amazing. Yeah. rebuilt, it should probably go another fifty years. There's nothing in there that really. Uh, you know, is going to deteriorate its metal and glass and mm -hmm. lubrication. And, uh, you know, it should go another 50 years without a problem. Well, I hope so. I mean, I really, uh, you're, you're doing God's work, I got to say. <laughs> um, it's just so labor intense. I wish I could oh find a way to do it faster. That, that camera oh. takes a week. You know, one guy oh, boy. working on it for 40 hours to like go from a 4008 to a classic. It's just, mm. You know, it's, it's a lot of time. In fact, I have some old, some old footage of you uh, of, um, let's see, where is it? Is it this one? Of, um, of, uh, it was, I found it on your YouTube. Oh, maybe that, this is not it. But of, of, of the, uh, oh, this is old. Uh, this is the sound. Oh, okay. This isn't, this isn't it. This is some uh, amazing old film of, I found on your uh, YouTube. Yeah, you know who made that film? A uh, no, Kodak. Oh, okay, <laughs> oh, interesting. Um, I, I always, I always wondered though. They made this whole film about how it was professional to make Super 8 films, but they shot it in 16. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> I, 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 I thought, hey, if you're going to make a film about how it is professional and doable to make super eight movies yeah why would you shoot it on super well, eight? like if you want to yeah, yeah. prove this point why not do it but they didn't they, they made a really nice film but they did it 16 millimeter <laughs> but that that brings us nicely on to this film that um you made i'm sure this was um and uh it was oops is it working um as the um of converting the max eight hang on that that there we go. We let's turn the volume down a bit on that. But yeah, I'm sh this was this was Super 8, right? This was uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It made sense to me to shoot something in Max 8 of making Max 8. Yes, right. absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So these are all the steps for all of you watching. These are the steps necessary to widen the gate of. I think this was a was it the Bolio or the anyway. yeah. yeah um, to make it um, to make it into the into the widescreen the format that we know that we know these days. That was kind of uh, you know a spin off of uh, several feature film productions because when mm -hmm. we do feature films that use Super 8, one of the big problems is matching the aspect ratio. Sure. Because yeah. Super 8 is kind of a square, and most movies in the theater are more like rectangles. Yeah. 
So what would happen is even though the professionals wanted the look of Super 8, they wouldn't frame it very well relative to their screen size. So mm -hmm. uh, I think John Toll was the first one to say, look, you need to give us some kind of viewfinder marking inside the camera so we can see where the frame of Super 8 is going to translate to the frame of, you know, 35 millimeter. Mm. So we put in this sort of crop line thing. And you just oh, start I think I just got to uh, so see where the frame was. Let's get, let's get and the, then they were go. doing a lot of stuff with anamorphics. So we would squeeze the picture on the Super 8 to put it in a 35 ah, millimeter. Yes. That, that required unsqueezing it to get it in the movie and... Those anamorphic lenses, although they're really cool and fun, they're really hard to work with. You know, I have, I have you some know. footage here from this. It's so wide, it's gonna it's gonna cut you off from the picture. Oh, but, oh that's uh, <laughs> nothing new. But that's this, amazing. That's that's the. Uh, um, what are, what are we looking at here? This is this is oh this was with the ultra double super eight, isn't it? This is an interesting new idea. This is to shoot on double super eight, but fill both frames with picture across. Right, so it's a 16 millimeter wide film. Yes. And eight it's millimeters a, tall. Yep, yeah, because it's double super eight. So it's yeah. two sides, and instead of using it, the way you would normally use it is you shoot down one side and flip it over the way the old yeah, yeah, works. Yeah. But instead of doing that, you're doing a picture across both frames. So that's right. producing bigger than CinemaScope picture. Okay. Uh, CinemaScope's 235, that's 3.1. Wow. And so you get the, you get the full um, uh, resolution rather than, you know, using an anamorphic lens to s squeeze it in, squeeze it yeah, up. Yeah, the anamorphics are just hard to work with on the amateur level because, they, you know, they're not, you know, you hold this lens in front of another lens. Mm. So you've got to build a bracket holder to hold it and... I mean, I did it with uh, several major motion pictures, like uh, Flatliners. I don't know if you remember that old film. Oh, yeah, I remember that. The uh, Julia Roberts yeah. and Ke Kiefer Sutherland film. Yep, yeah, yeah all that, that uh, dream flashback stuff is all Super 8 shot, anamorphic oh. Super 8. And uh, you remember that, that film, the, the Femme Nikita, but they made a yes. 35 movie? Uh, yeah. The Point of No Return. So that... There's an opening sequence in there that's all super eight and shy mm. anamorphic. But, you know, like, I mean, the guys were pulling their hair out trying to work this <laughs> super eight anamorphic camera. So, right, right, what right. we decided to do is rather than do anamorphic, we cut the gate out of uh, the aperture more in the camera. Mm. So, that's where the max eight comes, you know. Rather than try to like squeeze it, let's try to fill more of the frame with picture. So oh. nowadays, you know, most of the movies after those got made with Max right. and then with a crop line so they knew where the where the framing would be. Sure, sure, but well, that's brilliant. The whole thing is like a whole new, like, kind of, you know, we started getting into the double Super 8 again because yes. we wanted to use the double Super 8 film to make prints. Mm. So we ah. wanted to come from something to Super 8 rather than always going from Super 8 to something else, you know, go back right. the other way. I think I have a, a picture here of the, um, of the, of the camera that you, uh, that you used for that. Let me have a look here. Um, oh yeah. Okay. So here's some pictures of um, you, of your, uh, your staff preparing films to, to send yeah, out film Super stock. And there's yeah. some a whole bunch of stuff. Looks like it's come back to be developed. Yeah. And there's the uh, the developing machine. Yeah. Just I think it's brilliant that you do end to end Super 8. You know, you're fully self contained. Yeah. Well, is... you can't. I found when I first got to LA that that was the part of the film industry I think that was the worst conceived. That mostly you bought the film from Kodak, you shot it, you took it to photo chem to process it, and mm -hmm. you ran it down to Hollywood to one of those high end post facilities to scan it and you know so you went you bounced around town in mm. order to do anything which was good you had the, the best of each but when any ever anything went wrong everyone just blamed the other guy so right. you, you had terrible problems trying to sort out issues now on a professional level it kind of worked 
But as you started to apply this to less professional people, they, they just got so frustrated they gave up. So by putting it together where you could like tell the guy, oh, you started here, you ended here. If this went wrong, it was this or this. And you, and you were responsible for that. It really created a, you know, an environment where you could easily work mm, mm. rather than, like I said, going all over town, trying to figure all this stuff out. I mean, yeah. Hey, and then, we have this new thing that we're, we just came out with called Sprocket. And Sprocket ah. is kind of like our version of a, an assistant producer. We have, we have this, <laughs> great, this great footage here. Yeah, um, that is a commercial some, one of our customers did for it. So the idea here is you don't know anything about film, but you were trying to do film. So you just log online and this sprocket um, walks you through what you might need out of your Super 8, you know, in terms of processing, turnaround time, scanning, whether you want to ship it back to London or have a copy of it sent to your customer in Australia. You know, like you can coordinate the whole film workflow through this app and so you don't really need to like hire an assistant producer to like work in film you you can kind of handle it yourself because you've got sprocket there to help you and and he can figure stuff out for you like mm. how big's your file going to be when you scan super 8 to prores 444 mm. you know you're like because you want to send it to over the internet to you know somebody and it costs based on how many gigs there are. There's a lot of math and a lot of coordinating that has to go into film typically. Yeah, yeah. But the idea with Sprocket is now you could just do it with your app and you just concentrate on your shooting mm. and, and Sprocket will help you figure out the rest. Well, I can see, I can see the definite business uh, sense in keeping everything you know, in-house end-to-end because then your, your customers stay with you for the entire process. They don't try and... Yeah shop around um but i mean this is uh um let me see what have i yeah the um do you, oh yeah yeah what so what if, what about your relationships with other uh, uh super eight companies worldwide there aren't that many left is it no. still a, is it still a very competitive field or um no. is, is everyone kind of cooperative i think we've all gotten older and so we don't we don't like we're not in that is, you know, we're not that when we were young and more aggressive and more competitive, you know. Right. I, I know Ludwig at you know Andek very well and go visit him, you know, in Germany. And mm. um, uh, I, you know, I, I there's a lab in Boston uh, that you know the, that I know well, and sometimes even you know, we've done some things for one another, you know, uh, mm. you know, a processing machine breaks and you have to, you know get that stuff done, you know, you might have to go, you know, go talk to one of these, you know, to work together. Hmm. Um, there's a few people I don't get along with, you know, we don't share the same philosophy of like customer relations. Yeah, and, I could, I could and name stuff a few, like that. I could so, name some names, you know, but, um, <laughs> just now, like anybody. Yeah. Now for a while yeah, you, you, um, you set up here in London. I've got some, yeah. um, uh, in Golden Honda. Square, of all places, that's where um, that's, a, that's pretty much the uh, heart of the British film industry. And um, in fact, I think yeah. Paul McCartney has an office there. His uh, did, I don't know if you ever saw him, but um, um, do you have any other uh, any plans for future international expansion? Uh, that was a pretty uh, interesting experience. Uh, I had a, a guy who had written a book about Super 8, and he was trying to publish his book, and he really needed a job. So I kind of worked with him to, you know, kind of help him with his book publishing by allowing him to run an office in London. Mm -hmm. So that's how that got started. Uh, and so... Eventually, it grew, and I, I, I wound up having to go there myself and run the office. Um, uh, it, it's, uh, it was wonderful to, like, spend time in another country and get to know a different culture and do all that kind of stuff. It's just hard to, to, to be in two places at once. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, um, you know, what, what I was doing there was really exciting, and then what was happening here was suffering because I wasn't around to 
um, sure. to help out with what goes on here. So mm. I don't know if I'd open another office again. Well, I, I, a, a question's come in. A couple of questions have come in. Um, this is an interesting one. I, I should have asked this. Um, Ichabod to ask anyone training up younger folks as Super 8 camera technicians? Actually, I have a young lady who's like uh, working on cameras right now. Uh, she's starting with the Ronda cam. She's been at it for about six months. Um, yeah, I think that's the future. Okay. Uh, Definitely. I hope to get another one going and I got some plans on some other things on how to expand on the camera side of things it's it's quite busy um even if for example kodak does come out with this camera I, I their last projection was that it was kind of an expensive camera i think it was in the two or three thousand dollar range so yeah. Yeah. uh actually the majority of the camera sales are more like the 500 to one thousand dollar range right. so that that's really what i'm concentrating on is to try to provide reliable you know, five hundred to one thousand dollar cameras. Mm. I, I mean, mm. it's cool to have the 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 very expensive, you know, kind of does everything kind of camera. But really, the market has always been with you know people who are looking to uh, they're interested in you know in breaking them from you know into the field of photography and movies through a medium that really they can afford. Mm. So. Mm. Uh, you know, that's what Super 8 Sound was all about before I took over. You know, it's about schools mm. and teaching film. Mm. It, it's still the same thing. We just would build more bridges with, you know, different groups. But, you know, the, the intro person is still the heart of the machine. I've, I've got the most amazing picture that from your website. Oh, firstly, there's this, which is, oh, my God, that there's one that will get, get make me uh, make me jealous. This is a. Uh, that's yeah, this is, uh, <laughs> but um, but there's this one as well, which is like you've you've supplied ten Super Eight um, what Canon ten fourteen XLS. Yeah, yeah, that's a school program here and, in uh, the Los Angeles area. That's pretty into Super Eight. I just that's I just love the fact that there's ten of those out there now, and I I know that those students are going to put them through hell. But, yeah. but I, I really hope at the end of that, there's some that they're still working. Um, Yi, Yi Chang Sun says, hi, Phil, this is Gandalf. I don't know if you know someone called Gandalf, but he's, uh, he's watching now. Um, and um, uh, oh, yes, that's right. We're going to talk about your film out um, okay. process now. Oh, yeah, there's the uh, there's the, an old Bolex who you're, you were the double, <laughs> double Super 8, wasn't it? That's Patrick Mullen, I think. Okay. I He's a German uh, art filmmaker. Okay. Uh, he has some very uh, interesting stuff. Mm. Yeah, the film out thing is kind of a, an interesting uh, thought of like, uh, you know, like I say, does everything have to go from film to digital? What about going mm. from digital to film? Yeah, well, what exactly. What about the world of projection? What about the world of, incorporating other things into a super eight film like maybe you have some six i, I did a, a reduction print yesterday i was just looking at it before i came on but i was really happy how well it came out mm. it shot on 16 a piece of film shot on 16 negative then printed to super eight reversal so you know that that kind of uh, bridge between things and mm. like all the opportunities there might be. Oh my God. Film. Yeah. It, it totally opens up, opens up the field. I should say to people watching that the top um, right hand corner here is the original negative from super eight. And then the rest of the picture was digitized and then printed back out to super eight, which, and you know, to be honest, it, it looks, damn near the same it's uh the, it doesn't look like you've lost any any um any resolution there at all yeah there's a little loss just like that's normal kind of you know uh, analog to analog you know in the old days we used mm. to you know have to deal with the fact that every time we made a copy of something we lost a little yeah you know, not like the digital era but now but, here, and, and here you've got um a, a film that had gone kind of um you know um it had gone all magenta from age yeah. and that you scanned it color corrected it and then printed it back out to super eight 
Right. So you could fix things like that, you know, like old magenta prints, you know, and, and make new ones of them or, you know, something in your archive that's, uh, you know, really important to you mm -hmm. in film. I mean, there's a lot of film projecting that goes on in Europe. Um, you know, a lot of uh, clubs and, you know, uh, even mm -hmm. in, you know, not just in Europe, but in the United States, there's, you know, uh, you know, there's the main film industry where the big budget films are being released at the mall and that stuff. But there's also like film projectors everywhere, you know, mm -hmm. in terms of like, uh, art house cinemas and cities and uh, schools and you know so projecting yeah. on film is not completely out of uh, the loop of things but you have to have stuff to project mm. well it's, it's, you know, we it's it, revamping a super 8 projector because we've been doing the cameras and uh, we realized well you know all they have that someone would be able to project is what they generated themselves what made the old projector system kind of cool was you could get a film of something. You could get some pornos and watch them. You could get, you know, some mm. cartoons to show the kids. You could yeah. do stuff with a projector beyond just what you created. Mm. So what I'm kind of hoping is that uh, if we can develop this film out kind of idea, there'd be, you know, sort of uh, uh, new ways to use film, you know, out there in the world. Mm. Um Someone um, someone asks, where will we find Super 8 print stock and print print machines? Uh, was that was that done on a on a, a optical printer on Ektachrome? Yeah, well, this else? is a this is a digital to film process, so it's very similar to the the machine I have behind me. That's mm. going the opposite way. That's going from film to digital, mm. and now we're going the other way. We're going from digital to film. So we're using a camera, we're actually using a Bolex uh, um, double Super 8 camera to do the capture of the picture. Okay. So anything that is existing on digital can then now be put back out, film out to Super 8. Amazing. So maybe even just like uh, leaders, you know, if, if you wanted a nice uh, classic leader to put on the head of your right. Super right. 8 movie that you created, you wanted the a countdown, you know, like a traditional countdown, you know, you could you could have that stuff if you have a, a means to go from digital to Super 8. Mm. You know, they have this in 16 and 35 for major motion pictures. It's the, you know, the foundation of the entire film industry is to like be able to go from film put it on digital, do some stuff to it, and then put it back out on film. But we don't, we never had that in Super 8, really. Mm. Yeah. And this I, would put it in, in, in our capacity as, as Super 8ers to like have that kind of tool that, you know, it's sort of like the negative process. You know, we, we decided to cut 35 down to Super 8 because Super 8 filmmakers didn't have access to probably the most important and powerful filmmaking resource there was on the planet you know mm. 35 millimeter negative film mm. um, and you wanted to give it to them well this this kind of brings me on to um a, a question which i i like to ask people because it gets all sorts of reactions um <laughs> which is what's your opinion on um digital effects and apps that seek to mimic the look of super 8 is there any use for them are they helping to keep super 8 in the public consciousness or are they the work of pure evil it's funny you ask that because I've just spent the last week or so emailing back and forth with some guy who's doing it, mm -hmm. and he's, he wanted me to help him. And at first, I was like, "Oh my God, I got to go through this whole intellectual debate in my own head. Am I like selling out the soul of what I do mm -hmm. uh, by working on this? Uh, you know, what what is it? You know, kind of stuff." Um, and I'm I'm not you know because I I haven't really sort of gone through the whole process, so I'm not exactly sure, but I can say on, on some level, it brings people into the world of Super 8 because, you know, clearly, you know, as filmmakers trying to do things in film, it's becoming more and more obscure and you, you, can, you can obscure yourself out of existence if you're not, if you're not careful. So this brings, you know, if there's that many people who are interested in it, 
then, you know, bring them in so, we, you know, they, they can see. And having done some of it with them, you know, I, I created a green screen with a frame. So you could just do a, you know, flip the image in through green screen mm -hmm. and then made some grain mats so that you could throw mat, uh, grain over it. And then made some dirt and scratch mats so you could throw those over it, you know, with, you know, any editing program. Yeah. Uh, you know, it never really looks like Super It, you know. It, it yeah. like, there's just too much other character to it, like with the way the light comes into the camera and the flares and the just the whole thing. You just, it, at first when you look at it, and if you didn't compare it to something actually done in Super 8, you'd probably go, hey, yeah, that looks kind of like Super 8. But yeah. the minute you put something that actually is Super 8 next to it, it's like, oh my God, it looks like crap. You know, so <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, I'm not really afraid of it in terms of, you know, like, this is the way I look at it. I'm in Hollywood. There's more money than ever been thrown at images ever, you know, in the history of, you know, humanity here. And those guys still use things like Super 8 to create a scene in their movies. So if it could be done, they can do it. Mm. But they don't do it. Why? Because it really, A, can't be done that well, and B, takes more effort to do it that way than it does to go shoot the thing in the first place on Super 8 film. Yeah, yeah, well, right? yeah. If, if, they, if the big guys could do it, they wouldn't bother, you know, mucking around with, you know, having to deal with the, all the difficulties of using a 50-year-old Super 8 camera, I can tell you right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I've, I found in many cases the, the Super 8 emulation, the filters and the, uh, the phone apps that you get, they, they seem to mostly just want to overlay dust and scratches and maybe maybe they they kind of uh, bump up the uh, saturation a bit and yeah. grain and then they say there you, there you go there's a super eight look and then yeah. I, I I, the number of times I've had to sort of people have shown me like they've seen me with my bolia and they say well I can do that on my camera and then they show okay. me and uh, and then I think they're trolling me really I don't think they're uh, <laughs> they just want to get me riled up because I start in on a whole lecture about how about about um what's called dynamic range and 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 color palette and how you know grain like natural grain and when they you know and then they 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 basically i i, I always rise to the bait and they're always sorry that they brought it up <laughs> well you're a better arguer than i i remember when i first got involved in this you know this is back in the 70s right and yeah. uh i had my super 8 camera at a at a like a, a store looking for a case to put it in. And the guy in front of me had just bought a video camera, you know, VHS, you know, the big old thing. Oh, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. And so he, you know, we're waiting in line to check out. And he's like, what are you doing with that old relic? You know, <laughs> I mean, this is 77, you know, like he's like, that stuff's, you know, history, you know, like you need to buy, you know, and he just went off, you know, on like right. all the virtues of VHS uh video making and how he was saving all his money because you know like you know, he's giving all the money for film and I, I was an idiot you know that i i didn't see this and everything <laughs> so that that argument has been going on now for the 40 years i've been involved in it you know mm -hmm. and I, I just realized you know after i left that store and and was kind of frustrated because i'm not a great arguer like that um and then this very good um, filmmaker came in and, and wanted to buy a camera for me and she created this absolutely gorgeous movie about her grandmother and everything and I, I realized there's just different kinds of people out there there's mm -hmm. those who really understand the authenticity of doing something and have a talent and a skill and can can create beautiful things with uh, with a camera and then there's other guys who are just trying to impress you with what they just purchased yeah well listen let me let let's see that guy who was buying that video camera let's see what his vhs tapes look like these days the ones he shot back then which yeah. uh, which <laughs> which actually brings me to my um one of my last questions which is um your wife Rhonda has been um performing an important role in the preservation of super 8 archives um uh -huh. commercial and private um, she's also the author of uh, Get Real about your home movie legacy before it's too late. Snappy uh -huh. uh, title there. 
And uh, of course, um, she's the one that Rhonda Cam is uh, named after. Yeah. So my question is, who does the filming at family events? You or her? Uh -huh. <laughs> Mostly, I think I've got the camera. Mm. Uh, although, yeah, she has, she has no problem taking it from me and, you know, starting to go shoot and stuff like that. Mm. Uh, I, I think she's really uh, keyed into the fact that a large part of, you know, the interest, you know, in our business became archival stuff. And as, you know, you know, we'd get calls from, you know, major celebrities uh, thinking that, you know, I'm thinking, oh, my God, I'm going to get to work with uh, Steven Spielberg on something. Mm. And uh, what they really want is me to preserve, you know, the original eight millimeter films that he shot, you know, uh, when he was a kid. And the, and the work and the connection all became much more about the preservation of his legacy relative to film right. than going out and getting a chance to go shoot a movie with him. Mm. So as that kept happening, you know, through more and more celebrities, she, she sort of realized that that was as big a part of the business as, you know, what I thought was important, which was, you know, the shooting. Mm -hmm. So I, I think she's really helped me balance out that as a company mm. and realize, you know, we probably generate, you know, half of our revenue from, you know, people who are archiving their, their past history. And then through those relationships, some of them have wound up shooting things in their movies. You know, there's this super eight stuff in Steven's new movies too, you know, now, mm -hmm. and, you know, stuff comes up and it's like, you know, you become connected and they realize, Oh, you know, there's still some resource there. We could use that for something. Mm. Uh, so it's been great. But the, but the majority of the business part of it has been more in the archiving of those projects. Really? Really? You know, amazing. like uh, even the movie, let's say the movie Super 8, we had a few scenes in that Super 8 movie. But all the people that are in that movie, the director, the producer, the editor, all those guys, J.J. Abrams, all had Super 8 movies that they had shot. Mm -hmm. So we wound up remastering as part of the budget of the movie all the, their films. Oh, and wow. so it became a warm part of their whole like process of making a movie like this to have all their own authentic, you know, original films. Oh, wow. And, you know, I'm sure they partied hardy, you know, about, you know, like sharing, you know, hey, you know, and I, I have to admit, you know, I've seen it with, you know, a lot of people. There's uh, there's a lot of their history tied up in this, you oh, know, wow. so, you know, doing something like an archive project. Uh, brings people back together, you know, connect, reconnects you with, you know, your your college roommate, you know, that you made a film with, you know, when you're at school. And huh? it, it's a great natural way to bring people back together because you say, hey, you know, I'm just not calling you out of the blue. I call, I'm calling you up because I'm doing this thing, which is I'm going to try to fix up our old movie that we tried to make in freshman year in, in school. And, and I'm going to put it on digital and I'm going to redo the title. You know, it, it, it's a it's a beautiful process uh, for people to be together. Yeah, yeah. My, my daughter's at art school at the moment. My oldest daughter's at art school and um, and her and her friends, they they love Super 8. And they, of course, now now they they've got a contact, i.e. me to uh, develop their films for them. You know, they've right. all, they've been really inspired to to shoot more stuff like the stuff I I showed before. I was interested in what what JJ Abrams' early Super Eight was like. Did he did he show talent? Did he show some some promise? Uh, yeah, politically, I probably shouldn't say anything like that. <laughs> okay. Yes, but okay. Well, majority, of, I, I I once said to someone because I've transferred the first films of a lot of people um, that if you were to take and these are like the A-list guys, if you would take all those guys' first films and put them together with a, an average class of people from, you know, one of the local schools that has a film class, I am sure that you couldn't pick out which ones would be which. Right, right. Yeah, it's, it's just good to put the hours in and the time it's in. A, it's a progressive process. I did have a great experience one time with, um, oh, no, his name escapes me. Um Stanley Kubrick? The Evil Dead. Oh, Sam Raimi. Sam Raimi. Oh, okay, great, yeah. so Sam started out making Super 8 films. Mm -hmm. 
And at one point, one of his, the, the guys who made films with him, Bruce Campbell yeah. and Scott, Scott Spiegel, I think it was Scott that came in and he remastered all of their films. Mm-hmm. And I started transferring the first films that they made, like the very first roles of Super 8 they ever shot up through a movie called Within the Woods, which is basically Evil Dead shot in Super 8. It's like the 50-minute right. yeah, yeah. version, right? Yeah, yeah. And it was such an experience because over a week, I, I watched how someone goes from not really understanding how film language works to starting to get it, to as each movie progressed, the suspension of disbelief kept getting bigger and bigger. And by the time we watched Within the Woods, I mean, we were all like scared to death, like <laughs> watching that film. It was, you know, so spooky. Mm. And I was like, you know, this is how you learn this process. You, mm. you go through it. You know, it's not like, like regular language where you're at school and you learn all your vocabulary and stuff like that. It, it's more of it's done, you know, like what your daughter's doing with, by, by experimentation, mm. by, you know, progression, by putting time in, by making contacts, by doing mm. projects mm. after projects. So it, it was nice to see, you know, someone go from nothing to the guy who makes major motion pictures and see how he actually, you know, yeah. kind of progressed in that I, area. I seem to remember an early story about the making of Evil Dead that that they would take that within the woods film on a projector and and just yeah. go around and screen it for possible investors and like yeah. just just like hardware store owners and and all sorts of people yeah. who and that the because it was on Super 8 and a projector it was reasonably portable and it wasn't mm-hmm. like you could show a a a a, 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 a sizzle reel on an iPad to them those days that you they'd have to go yeah. in and set up a projector and and show it to, to raise money. That's how they did it. They raised uh, almost three hundred thousand to reshoot really that thing in sixteen hmm. because they they were going to make because they were trying to do a drive-in movie. And before that film, most of their films were more um, Three Stooges style comedy movies. Hmm. Uh, a lot of their efforts were all in the comedy sector. So, but hmm. then when they got to where they wanted to actually go commercial, they realized they had to make something that would sell in the drive-in. So they decided to switch over and try to make a horror movie. Right. But you can kind of right. tell that their comedic overtones just Definitely. Couldn't, yeah. Yeah. didn't stay out of the process. They oh, just yeah. couldn't help themselves by, you know, they were just too tied into the comedy of stuff. Yeah, yeah, and you I can see that, that in Evil Dead 3. There's, there's, a, there's so much, like, people getting slapped in the face with skeleton hands and stuff it is it is hilarious well phil you're a busy man (laughs) i will um we've been we've been going on so long there's that i'm gonna leave the last question to the uh to the audience and um it's uh (laughs) um let's see where is it i saw one here scott chamberlain asked uh, how much would it cost to get a Bolia 4008 ZM2 cleaned and lubed? I'm sure you'll, the answer is it depends. Uh, well, we mostly just rebuild them completely. So it's about fifteen dollars or $1,800 to do, to do the entire process. It takes about a week. Uh, and that's converting over all the subsystems in the Bolia that, that we don't like, like the hand grip and, and changing things that we just... You know, there, there are things that break, and so we got rid of them so that, you know, when you went out and shot, you wouldn't have to worry about mm. the little power switch in the back of the hand grip going out in the oh, middle yeah. of your shooting. Oh, yeah. You know, oh, yeah. so know about that. we tend not to service them. We tend to focus on just rebuilding cameras. Right. Brilliant. Well, listen, um, Phil, I've, I've, I've um, learned so much today, and uh, I want to thank you very much for coming on the show. Oh, you're welcome. And I have to say, you know, in watching the beginning of the show, I think you're onto something really good because it, it, this medium really provides an opportunity to show people what you're talking about. Yeah. Rather than just writing about it or just talking yeah. about it, you can see it. Well, and thanks. So, yeah. I think, I think. It makes so more sense to be in this format. And, you know, although COVID forced you probably into doing something like this, I think uh, in the end, you're going to realize that. It was probably, you know, we call it the COVID silver linings, which are 
the new mm. things that we're now doing because COVID forced us to do something different. Mm. And now we're realizing, hey, this is really a kind of a good idea to like do things this way. Yeah. And we're kind of glad that something, we're not glad, but we're appreciating the fact that something happened in the world that, that forced us to go change and for the better. So I, I think this is a fantastic uh, idea that you have here for the show. Oh, well, thank you. Thank uh, you. I'm, I mean, I want to, I want to show the, the people out there that, you know, if just cause I'm into film and super eight and stuff, it doesn't mean I'm a Luddite and I, I I'm scared of technology that, that it goes hand in hand, all the new technology with the old technology. And, oh, yeah. um, oh, you have to know both. I mean, yeah. it's like, if you really want to function in the creative world, you have to be all knowing in terms of like what's going on because it requires it to make good film. You have to understand all the disciplines that come together to make a good film. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you're trying to just do it digitally and trying to say, no, I don't need to learn all that other stuff. It's like, you're really doing yourself a disservice and you won't find yourself getting those jobs moving up the ladder because you need that all that extra that other information that's critical to mm. various parts of doing production you'll you know the best way to do something you're not just doing it the only way you know how yeah and also yeah and it definitely and super eight definitely gives you discipline as well in terms of you know you you set your shot up and make sure it's all right before you start filming because you know that, yeah. that film is expensive <laughs> analog experience is a good one mm. Well, great. Well, thank you very much, Phil, for coming oh, on the show. And I right. um, hope to uh, chat to you soon. Uh, yeah, I'm we'll sure there's you. many, many things we can talk about for hours and hours. But uh... <laughs> Yeah, I could go longer than an hour. Okay. All right. Thanks, Speak ben. to you later. Bye. Right. That was Phil Vision, everyone. My God, that was so great. Ah, oh, it's, uh, whoops. I had other stuff to ask, Phil. And uh, because I try to keep these shows to an hour, an hour and a half maximum, then, um, then you know, <laughs> there's a limit to how much I can, uh, I can go on. Mm -hmm.